Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christopher. What a beautiful prayer that will lead us right into what the Lord has for us in the scriptures this morning. So if you are able, would you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Hear the word of the Lord. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Most merciful and gracious, holy God, all this morning you have allowed us to enter into your presence with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise, in song, in prayer. And so, Father, we thank you that you, in your love, in your faithfulness, in your grace and goodness, you have already begun to minister to hearts, to souls, to relationships, to lives, Lord, that are meant to be nurtured by you. the one who has first loved us, the one who has done for us what we could not do for ourselves, the one who has brought us back to himself, reconciled us through the life and the death and the resurrection of your perfect son, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The word made flesh. So please continue to speak to us now, O Lord. May your word ring true in our hearts. May it bear fruit in and through our lives as your people for such a time as this. May the meditation of our hearts now upon your word be pleasing unto you, O God. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. It's not fair. Do you remember the very first time you uttered those three words? Yeah, me neither. I'm sure I was far too young to be able to recall exactly the first time I said (laughs) that phrase, and probably you were too. I mean, isn't it fascinating how even from a very teeny tiny age, Something within us cries out in protest when we experience things in this world that we don't think are the way that they should be. It's not fair, we say. By the time we can barely walk and talk, we've already developed very strong opinions about how things should be in this life. And at the same time, we we develop very strong reactions when things don't turn out that way. (laughs) It's not fair we say. Well, we may think we know what is fair, but the question is, do we know what is right? And are they the same thing? In our reading today, as we just heard it from 1 Peter chapter 2, we want to unpack these scriptures carefully this morning. And, and to do that responsibly, we need to do what we should always do when we are studying the scripture. And that is to make sure we, we know exactly who that first century audience, well, in first century in case of the New Testament, first century audience was. 
And in this case, the passage we just read, if we back up one more verse to verse 18 of 1 Peter 2, we learn that, that Peter here is speaking very plainly to servants. Hear what he says. Servants, or more bluntly, slaves, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Now, of course, to our 21st century Western sensibilities, we cannot fathom a world in which slavery would be seen as normative. That is something, thank God, that is foreign to us. But in the first century Roman Empire, it was very much normative. In fact, those poor folks couldn't imagine a world without slavery. Historians will tell us that as many as one-third to maybe even as many as one-half of those living under Roman rule were enslaved in one form or another. To quote the great theologian Bruce Hornsby, it's just the way it is. That's hard for us as, as Americans today to comprehend, isn't it? I mean, we are a people who, who place tremendous value upon freedom as being, being free to do what we choose with our lives. Many in our country today would define freedom as, as being in control of our own destiny, as having authority and autonomy to make personal choices for ourselves regarding our lives and, and, and those of our family. Now, that may be how we as Americans define freedom, but is that how the Bible defines freedom? Have you ever considered that question is this really a Christian idea of what true freedom looks like? Now, listen, I, I am so thankful to live in the country in which we live. Don't get me wrong. But, but let me say a little bit more and put it this way. Are any of us ever fully in control of our lives? Do any of us have full authority? Do any of us have full autonomy? Now, listen, answering those questions if you were part of Peter's first century audience, would have been quite easy to do. <laughs> but what about us? This is where our American ideas about freedom might begin to rub up against some of our Christian ideas and understanding about true freedom. Uh, let me explain what I mean. Let me ask you one more question. How much in these last several weeks how much have you had to realize how little is in our complete control? We live in an on-demand world now, or so we think, able to access anything we want when we want it. And when that has been removed from us, how do we respond? When our plans, our schedules, our agendas, our lives get radically redirected, or some nearly shut down altogether. How should we respond? That is the question for us as Christians today. You know, Peter was writing to people who had plenty in their lives they knew they could not control. And so Peter, as a vessel of God's grace, wrote to remind that first century church of what they could control by the power of the Holy Spirit alive within them, according to the example that Christ had set before them and that Christ has set before us. So the question for Peter's audience then, as well as now, I would say, is that when we cannot control so much in this life, what can we control according to God? And along with that, what are we actually responsible for in this life as followers of Jesus Christ, knowing that there are some things, maybe many things, that are well outside of our control? Those are important questions that I'm sure many of you have already been thinking about, already been asking yourself in these recent weeks. So let's hear what direction Peter may offer in addressing those very questions, shall we? So let's continue. Verse 19, where we began today. Hear what Peter writes. For this is a gracious thing. Some translations say this is a credit to you. If when mindful of God, aware of God's presence, you endure sorrows. Some translations say pain, pain of mind or, or body. 
while suffering unjustly, undeservedly, wrongfully. And then Peter goes on, he says, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Now, Peter wants to be very clear here. All of us know that, that there is a certain kind of suffering that comes as a consequence to, to sin, to doing wrong. Eventually, that will come in our lives, and all of us know too well the pain that kind of suffering brings. But that is not what Peter's focus is right here in this verse. He wants his hearers to be clear about that. And so he goes on, verse 20. But if when you do good, if when you do the right thing and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Other translations say you actually have God's approval. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, if you're like me, right now in the back of your mind, your 10-year-old self is saying, wait a minute, that's not fair. I mean, why would you suffer for doing good? Why would you suffer for doing the right thing? That's not how this is supposed to work. I mean, you do good things and good things will come to you. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? I mean, what goes around comes around. We get that. Hey, you reap what you sow. Ben, that's in the Bible, isn't it? Work hard, save a lot, pay your taxes, pay your bills, pay your tithes, go to church, eat your Wheaties, and surely the American dream will come to you. I mean, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Isn't that fair? Well, the scriptures teach us very clearly that when we do what is right according to God, we will be rewarded, again, as defined by God. That much we do know. But does that mean that the reward will come ultimately? Yes. Does it mean it comes immediately? Maybe not. Hear what else we have to understand here. You may be somebody who's thinking, well, Ben, listen to me. I, I, that's not what I signed up for. I came to Christianity and thought in following Christ that my life would get easier, my life would get better, and, 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 and now you're saying it might get harder? Hmm. Well, let's see what Peter has to say to that, shall we? Peter goes on, verse 21, as he has said, when you do good and, and, and suffer, he says, endure. When you do the right thing and you actually are suffering in that or because of that, he says, endure. And he goes on, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And then he says, according to Isaiah 53, applying this ancient passage to Christ, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, which which means abused, when he was abused, he did not abuse others in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus didn't endure just by white knuckling it and saying, I can do this, I think I can, I think I can. No, he was able to endure because he entrusted his whole self, his whole entirety of being to the one he knew judges justly, the one who does not slumber or sleep, the one who sees and knows all, especially that which is right. Peter goes on, speaking of Jesus again, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree upon that cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you are healed. And that, my friends, now that is not fair. (laughs) You know, some people say that fairness is people getting what they deserve. Well, lucky for us that Jesus shows us that God is far more concerned with justice, which in God's kingdom is about giving people what they truly need. Thank God for our sakes that that Christ did not live and die by what was fair, but instead he lived and died and was raised again to show us and to make possible for us what is just, what is right, what is good, and according to the life-giving standards of the kingdom of God, what is most important in this life. 
What this means for us, my friends, is that Christ didn't willingly choose to suffer and die for us because we deserved it. Christ willingly chose to suffer and die for us because it was what we needed. Even those of us who would fight him, even those of us who would deny him, even those who would run from and reject him. What did we sing just a few minutes ago? When I was your foe, Still your love fought for me. What does that mean to you? And you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. And you have been so, so kind to me. And then we sing it. Sing it with me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It's not fair. But it's right. It's just It's what we need. And Peter concludes with verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now been returned. It's important to understand. Some translations say, but now you have returned. The verb there is passive, which means you and I didn't do it. It means somebody else, something else has gotten us, has chased us down, has brought us back in. We have been returned to the good shepherd, the overseer of our souls. It's not fair, is it? (laughs) That God would love us in this way. When we can so easily forget who he is and likewise forget whose we are. It's not fair, but according to the heart of God, it is what is right. So, that's what God does in the person and work of Jesus Christ as the light of the world. We sing it, he stepped down into our darkness, into the wrongness of this world, the injustice, even the unfairness, and he takes it all upon and within himself upon the cross. And so what Peter is saying, my friends, is that that's why we then, as his church, are also called to carry his light into the darkness, into the wrongness, into the injustice, into the unfairness of this world as our good shepherd, as our master, as Jesus did. He still does through his people, through his body, which is his church on the earth today. Remember his command to anyone who would be his disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Now let's be clear, what Jesus didn't mean by that is that you or I could somehow die an atoning death for the sins of the world. No, that was his and his alone as sacrifice once and for all and as for savior of the world, the creation being reconciled to its creator by the creator himself. Only God in Christ could do that. What Jesus meant, take up your cross and follow me, was that we are to lay down our lives daily, to die to sin so that he may raise us to walk and live in righteousness for the sake of one another as we walk in his footsteps. Remember Jesus' other command, one that he gives us as we read it in in John chapter 15. Hear the words of the Lord when he says, my command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than that he would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, no longer call you slaves, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you 
and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If there was ever a time for us to take Jesus at his word on this church, it is now. In this day, this age, this season, there are so many questions, so many questions we all want answers to right now, aren't there? And we don't have all the answers, not yet. Sure, some people think so, but then so does the other person who has a very different idea and a very different opinion about what's really going on and how we should respond. So much we can't control. But again, what has God told us clearly we can control in this time of uncertainty, in this time of waiting, in this time where we are still called to be the church? Right now, many people all over the world are struggling, are suffering. And many of them, many of you, are suffering because we have been doing at least what we have thought, as best we could know at the time, has been right, has been good. No one entered into shelter-at-home quarantine because they wanted to. Well, maybe, maybe some diehard introverts, maybe some people who have been training for this their whole lives. <laughs> but that's not most people. Most people entered into shelter at home uh, because they, they felt like it was the right thing. We, we heard from experts from all walks of life that, that this is what it means to be a good neighbor. This is what it means to, to care for one another. And, and so we have wanted to do that. We have wanted to do the right thing, to love one another, to look out for one another, especially those, as far as we can tell thus far, are most vulnerable to COVID-19. Many of you have sacrificed greatly to do this. And to continue doing this. For us here in Davidson County in Nashville, we know the stay-at-home order is still in place, supposed to be, until the end of this next week. And many of you have sacrificed tremendously. Not because it's what you wanted to do, but it's because what you have believed has been right. To care for others. To look out for one another. You've given up all kinds of things. Over these past several weeks, your hair is going everywhere. You've got all kinds of things that you haven't been able to do. We've lost all kinds of normal events and expectations for this time of year in our culture, young and old alike. Many of you have lost income. Maybe you've even lost your job completely in this time. Many of you have endured other hardships. Maybe there have been other health issues that, that, that have had to be put on hold as far as treatment or, or how they've been taken care of because we've been trying to figure out how do we best respond to what may come with COVID-19. Some of you are dealing with, with loneliness, with anxiety. Some of you have, have been biting, uh, battling, I should say, addictions that, that have, have, have been threatening to come back to haunt you in this time of isolation. These are all very real challenges, extremely difficult. And yet because many of you have thought what you were doing was the right thing, you have sacrificed out of love for your fellow man and woman and child. Hear me when I say this. God sees you. God honors you in your suffering. And God is with you and so is his church. So what are we to do? What are we to do? How are we as the church to respond with what we can control right now? We make sure that the words we speak and the words that we share online are true, are trustworthy. We follow in the footsteps of our master. Remember what, what Peter said, quoting Isaiah 53, applying it to Jesus. He said, there was no deceit in his mouth. As best we can, my friends, let no deceit be in our mouths. Don't just post something online because somebody else did. Don't just say something because this is what I feel in the moment. I'm going to go ahead and spit it out there. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Ask the Lord for temperance. Ask the Lord for the gift of self-control, which he says we can have by the power of his Holy Spirit in us. We do not return abuse with abuse. That's one thing we definitely can make sure we do in this time. Christians do not fight fire with fire. 
Because you know what happens when we do? Everybody burns. Remember the words of Proverbs chapter 15, the first four verses, a soft word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. We do not threaten when we suffer. Now I know there's something in us, that same thing that wants to scream out it's not fair. There's something in us that wants to lash out in our pain. We want to take it out on somebody or something. There's something within us that wants to retaliate and we feel justified in doing it when we are facing unjust criticism or, or suffering. But again, thank God that we have the power, supernatural power by the spirit available to us in our response in Christ if we will do one thing, if we will, as Christ did himself, entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. There are things we are tempted to handle ourselves that we best let God deal with. Sometimes that's hard to remember. Thank God for the word to remind us. Well, as I start to pull this message together to a close this morning, can God make a way where there seems to be no way? I know we want to know dates. I know we want to know when will we be together in one place again? When will things, quote unquote, go back to normal? We are learning, my friends, what it means in a new way to pray, give us this day our daily bread. There is so much that is not in our control. And that, that's the truth about all of life. But it takes a time like this to show us clearly that just because we can schedule things, just because we can plan things, doesn't mean that's all within our complete control. We are working on a plan as Christ Church, which we will share more in this next week about how we take steps trying to honor those in our community with whom we live in being good citizens, being faithful Christians and good citizens at the same time. It is not either or, my friends. It is both and. God gives us the wisdom and the grace to do this. But what about those who are most in need right now? What about those who are suffering right now? and need help. Maybe you are one of the people I mentioned before that has no idea how you are going to recover financially from this COVID-19 crisis. Maybe right now you are looking at the bank account and you are afraid. It's not fair what you've lost through no fault of your own. You've worked hard, you've done it all right, and now, now you deal with this. Well, this is where being the church matters. This is where God knows better than you realize what you're going through. God sees. And so I encourage you, entrust yourself to him to move forward in this one step at a time. Because maybe, maybe someone else out there right now watching me, listening to me, maybe right now you are someone who has your job. You are someone who's been doing just fine. Maybe you're doing better than fine financially in this time. And you've been thinking, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair that I and my family should be doing okay while so many other people are hurting. Or maybe right now God is speaking to you, saying, yes, I wanna work through you as a vessel of grace to bless someone else, to come alongside a brother or sister or family in need for such a time as this. That's how the church has always survived, my friends. Not just survived, but thrived. Could it be that God is allowing us to experience something much deeper and richer in him and with one another in the same way now for those who will receive that, for those who will ask God, what is right, what is good, what is just in this time? And if you say, well, Ben, I'm not sure who that might be. If I, if I could reach out to somebody or could help somebody, pray about it. And I don't mean that off the cuff or in a cliche, Christianese kind of way. I mean, seriously, pray. Say, Lord, show me. Show me. Lead me. And he will. He will. Well, church, living and loving in the way of Christ, it means there are times we will suffer for doing the right thing. As long as we live in a world that is not yet 
fully reconciled to God. A broken world, we might call it. There will be suffering at times, even when we do the right thing. But be encouraged. God is not mocked. God is not long waiting as we might be tempted to think. God is present. God is moving. God is doing things that we yet may not see nor comprehend. And that's why Peter says, entrust yourselves to him. Again, Proverbs, and you all know this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon. The the Hebrew says, do not put all your weight upon your own understanding. Acknowledge him, know him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. That promise is as real today for you and me as ever. Even if we don't know what tomorrow may bring, even if we don't know exactly when this sanctuary will be full again, and oh, hear me, I want that as bad as you do. I do. But you know what I want even more for you? Is that you would know God in the deepest of ways. That in this time, even in such a time as this, even if it's only you and the Holy Spirit sitting in your living room right now, that in this time, this time would not be wasted, however long it lasts, but that God would reveal himself to you and that you would receive him in a way that is so rich, so life-giving, so deep, even in the midst of whatever it is you might be dealing with right now where you are. More than I want us all together in this sanctuary, I want that for you. I want that for me. Because if we embrace that now, when he does bring us back together, what a joyous, beautiful time that will be. And I won't even have time to preach. There'll be too many stories to tell, too many testimonies to share. But that's already happening right now. Stories of hope. We're asking you to share those, church, and you can come to the website. You can work right through the website to share those. Don't be shy. Ask the Lord to reveal what he is doing. What hope is living and growing and bearing fruit through you now. That's what he has for you. That's what he has for us. We must trust, my friends, that we will see life spring forth from what may look like death. We will yet see resurrection, even in the midst of what may seem like destruction. And we will see, as we already are, the kingdom of God breaking through as his will is done through his people on earth as it is in heaven. Church, would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you now asking you to give us this day our daily bread, which is not just our food literally for this day. It is our nourishment spiritually. As you have said repeatedly throughout your word, Human beings do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so word of God, continue to speak into our hearts, our minds, our lives this day. Your truth, your peace, your hope, your justice, your righteousness, your encouragement, strength for today and hope for tomorrow. This is what you bring to us, Lord, what you so freely give in your love through your word. Praise you, Lord. Thanks be to God. For all the things 
we know all too well we cannot control. You have given us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love. A spirit of power to walk in the footsteps of Christ as you have called us to and of a sound mind to walk in wisdom, not to force things out of fear. but to trust you, to learn, to receive, to lay down our lives for one another as you have first laid down your life for us. You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life, and these things cannot be found apart from you or from walking in your footsteps, Jesus. So order our steps in your word. Order our steps in your spirit that we may perfectly love you, Lord. That is our prayer. And walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. We thank you. We know that you shall be faithful to complete what you have begun in your people, even in and through such a time as this. Lord, show people out there right now who it is that you would call us to, to, to serve, who it is you would call us to reach out to, who it is that you would call us to give toward, whether that's uh, financial help, whether that's a gift of time or presence, Lord, the, the beauty, the power of a phone call in such a time as this. Oh, something we have forgotten in an age of texting and Facebook messaging. Lord, have your way. Work in us, work through us. And let us entrust ourselves completely to you, no matter what comes, because you are the one, the good shepherd, the good father, the Lord, the giver of life who judges justly. And nothing that is done, nothing that is done out of love as you have shown it to us in and through Christ will be condemned. It will indeed be rewarded by you, oh God. We thank you and we trust you. Thank you for making us yours. Thank you for bringing us back to you. As your sons, your daughters, the sheep of your pasture, we give you thanks and we love you. Thank you for loving us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Now receive this blessing spoken over those upon whom God places his name as the ancient priests of Israel used to proclaim. And as we proclaim now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his shalom, his peace. Now and forevermore, amen and amen. Let us go in peace, brothers and sisters, to love and serve the Lord and one another. Thanks be to God.